prayer meeting broadcast once again, the series The Connecting Link, a study of the book of Acts. And um, tonight I would like to uh, start by praying for a few families of our church. I would like to pray for the Rubino family, for Jay and Gail and their extended family. Also pray for the Jimenez family, Isabel and her extended family, and for the Mesa family, Christine and her extended family. Also, uh, we would like to have a special prayer uh, tonight for Jean Huang, for Dorinda Blank, for Rinku Roy, for Jim Maybe, for Julia Jorgensen, and perhaps others that will be, uh, you know, united as we pray. Let me, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for listening to us tonight, for allowing us to meet and uh, and do this study. We ask in a special way, O oh Lord, that uh, you may bless everybody who will be tuning in and listening to our programming tonight. As we pray in a special way for the Rubino family, we ask, O oh Lord, that they may be uh, blessed by you, that you may give them health and, and blessings and protection. Also pl- uh, pray for the Jimenez family, Isabel. Uh, bless her as she continues serving you in the, in the academy. Also bless the uh, Mesa family, Christina and her family. Be with all of them. And um, we're so thankful for our families. We present before you uh, Jean Huang and also Dorinda Blank and also Rinku Roy and Jim Maybe and Julia Jorgensen. And if there's somebody out there who is in need of our prayer, we also include that person tonight. And may the Holy Spirit speak to me and to everyone tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank you for coming and tuning in tonight. Uh, Coming in the month of January, uh, the month month of January will bring us a new series, The Redeemer. Uh, It's based on the book of Ruth, and uh, I am looking forward to that short series, but, uh, you know, uh, compact and deep and concise. So I hope that you join us uh, starting January 20th at uh, 2021 at 7 p.m. That's a Wednesday, so... Thank you for, for coming and for tuning in tonight. The next week, we're going to be studying the second to last uh, 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 you know, study on our series, uh, The Roman Citizen. And uh, uh, it's a nice study about uh, Paul, Paul's uh, status, uh, Acts 22 through 26. That's next week. But tonight, we're going to study chapters 21 through 22. Uh, Paul is back in Jerusalem. Now, the ship sailed from Miletus, Southeast Asia Minor, on his way to Patara, South Asia Minor, and then Paul and his companions boarded a cargo ship bound for Caesarea in Israel. Now, there they stayed at Philip's house. Philip was one of the seven deacons chosen to serve with, together with Stephen. I don't know if you remember that in Acts chapter 6 through 8. Now, a prophet named Agabus uh, found out from Judea, found out that Paul uh, arrived into Philip's house and he came around and visited him. And as he did, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet and said the following. He prophesied the following. The Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt. So this prophet uh, Agabus was basically uh, relating to the people out there who uh, were visiting while Paul was visiting, uh, of what would, will happen to Paul in Jerusalem. Now, as Paul's disciples tried to convince him not to go to Jerusalem because of what the prophet just said, Paul replied the following, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? He said, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That is found in uh, Acts 21, 13. And so Paul and his companions then headed toward Jerusalem, uh, uh, southeast towards Jerusalem. We pick up the story in Acts 21, verses 17 through 26. Paul and his team were welcomed warmly in Jerusalem as they arrived. Soon they met with James and all the missionary, uh, uh, I'm sorry, all the elders of of the uh, Jerusalem to report on his third missionary journey, his last one. Quickly, James and the elders go on to bring out the negative stuff they, they have heard about Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, so as he's 
uh, there, you know, this is what's happening. So you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are sellers for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who lived among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? This is what James, the leader of the church, is telling Paul about his report that he heard. Then they proceeded to suggest that Paul take four Jews who have made a vow so that Paul can join them in a purification ceremony to appease the Jews. So Paul accepted their suggestion, and they proceeded to do this purification, purification ceremony. Then things go sour for our friend Paul. As he is walking in the temple, he is seen by Jews from the province of Asia. Remember those Jews that almost killed him and stoned him to death? Now they're visiting Jerusalem because of the feasts, and, and they see Paul in the temple. So these stir up the whole crowd against Paul, and they seized him. Let's follow the story in Acts 21, 28 through 36. We read, shouting, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law on, on this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. Verse 30. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Uh, seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. Verse 31. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Verse 32. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd when rioters uh, so the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Verse 33, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked he, uh, who he was and what he had done. Verse 34, some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Verse 35, when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. Verse 36, the crowd that followed kept shouting, away with him. So they were really trying to kill Paul. Now, in order to understand the general context of what's happening here, we need to understand the following. Number one, that Paul rejected the idea that the Old Testament laws bring salvation to those who keep them. Now, he understood that salvation is only freely given by God's gracious act. Uh, so, you know, salvation is by faith. It has nothing to do with what you do or what you keep. And this is what he's emphasizing to them. So the laws are no, of no value for salvation except to show us our sin. So the law is like a mirror that shows you that something is wrong with you, but it doesn't do anything to you. It doesn't clean you. It doesn't fix it. You know, uh, it doesn't uh, subscribe anything. It's just uh, it's there to point you out that something is wrong and guide you to the one that will be able to fix it. Now, secondly, Paul accepted the view that the Old Testament laws prepare for and teach about the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, Christ fulfilled the law and released us from the burden of of his guilt, right? The guilt of the burden of the law. The law still teaches many valuable principles, uh, I'm sorry, principles and provides guidelines for grateful living. Uh, but Paul understood that the law did not save. Uh, Paul was not observing the laws in order to be saved. So he was simply keeping the laws as custom to avoid offending those who he wished to reach with the gospel. In Romans chapter 3, Verses 21 through 24, we read the following. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Verse 22. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, verse 24, and are justified freely by, by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul is writing to the Romans and he's telling them, you don't need 
to do anything to be saved. Only believe. By faith, you believe. And then, secondly, he's saying, we have all sin, we're sinful, and we're, short, we're falling short of the glory of God. So, therefore, we, are, we have been justified, declared righteous or innocent by, freely by his grace, by his redemption that came through Jesus at the cross. This is what he's telling them. Uh, furthermore, Paul believed the, fo the following, Romans chapter 7, 4 through 6. Let's read it. Verse 4. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might, might bear fruit to God. Verse 5, for when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. Verse 6, but now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the in new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So what he's saying is, what he's saying is the law guides you to Christ, but it doesn't save you, but it can condemn you. The law doesn't save, but it can condemn you. So if we have been condemned to sin, uh, to die eternally, now we, we can remove that law that says that because Jesus has provided eternal salvation when he died for you and I at the cross. Now, in the general context of Romans 7, 4 through 6, uh, if you read the first three verses of that uh, chapter, chapter 7 of Romans 1 to 3, uh, Paul uses marriage to illustrate our relationship to the law. So he says, when a spouse dies... The law of marriage no longer applies. Because we have died with Christ, he says, the law can no longer condemn us. Now, we rose again when Christ was resurrected, and as new people then, we belong to Christ. We're no longer under the law. We are under the grace of Christ. Now, his spirit enables us to produce good fruit for God. We now serve not by obeying a set of rules, but rather out of, of renewed hearts and minds that overflow with love from God. Now, when a person dies to the old life and belongs to Christ, a new life begins. Now, on an unbeliever's mindset is centered usually on his or her own personal gratification. Those who don't uh, uh, follow Christ have only their own self-determination as their source of power. By contrast, God is at the center of a Christian's life, at least he ought to be. Right? God supplies the power for the Christian's daily living. Believer, fi believers find that their whole way of looking at the world changes when they come to Christ. So the law of marriage is used by, Peter, uh, by uh, Paul here sorry, to explain our relationship to the law. Now, some people try to earn their way to God by keeping a set of rules, like obeying the Ten Commandments, or attending church faithfully, or doing good deeds. Now, all of those are good, but all they earn for their efforts is frustration and discouragement. You are not saved by doing all of, uh, by doing all of that. However, because of Christ's sacrifice, the way to God is already open, and we can become his children simply by putting our faith in him. So uh, Paul is dealing with a mindset that has... Uh, shaped uh, Israel for thousands and thousands of years where they expected to do things in order for them to be saved. That's why they followed the law of Moses with 613 commandments. And uh, they thought that the commandments would save you, and if you didn't do them, uh, you were going to hell. Now, no longer trying to reach God by keeping the rules, we can become more and more like Jesus as we, as we live with him day by day. Now, let the Holy Spirit turn your eyes away from your own performance and toward Jesus. Your performance means nothing for your salvation. It means something to, be, to testify to others. That's good. And to help others. But nothing regarding your salvation. Now, he will free, Jesus will free you to serve him out of love and gratitude. Keeping the rules then, the laws and the customs of Christianity doesn't save us. Uh, so no, need, no deeds needed, only the blood of the Lamb. Of course, I understand what James uh, said in his book, that but you, we, need, we need to have faith and also 
uh, you know, actions of faith, right, uh, deeds. That is true. But that's, co that's coming as a result of being already saved by faith. You don't do that to be saved. You, you do actions and deeds because you're already saved. So salvation is by faith only. Now, just like Paul, we can find no relief in the synagogue or church until we look, we, uh, we look to Jesus uh, himself for our salvation. The key is to allow the Holy Spirit to change and transform our hearts. Now, because Jerusalem was under Roman control, an uproar in, uproar in the city would be uh, investigated by Roman authorities. The commander of the troops uh, at this time during Paul's time was Claudius Lysias, according to Acts 23-26. This commander was head of a cohort or legion of Roman soldiers, and he was the senior Roman officer in the whole Jerusalem area. This commander arrested Paul and ordered him bound with two chains. Now, he then asked, uh, you know, around who he was and what he had done, verse 33. Since he couldn't, since he couldn't get the truth about who Paul was, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks, inside the prison, where he could be investigated a little further. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that we, you and I need to be looking at Jesus, right, uh, in order to be saved and nothing else. Now, this mob uh, in Jerusalem was so violent that the soldiers had to carry Paul to safety. The crowd kept on shouting, away with him. In Acts 21, 37 through 40, we follow the story. Verse 37, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. And verse 38, Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? Verse 39, Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Verse 40, Having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and mo uh, motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic. So notice the following. By speaking Greek, Paul showed that he was a cultured and educated man, not just a common rebel starting riots in the streets. His language skills grabbed the commander's attention and gave Paul protection and the opportunity to give his defense. Now, the historian Josephus wrote about an Egyptian who led a revolt of 4,000 people in Jerusalem around 54 A.D. and then had disappeared. So the commander assumed that this was Paul, uh, the rebel, that rebel, but soon confirmed that he was not. Now, Paul is allowed to address the angry mob, the angry crowd. He addressed them in Aramaic. Now, the common language among the Palestinian Jews was Aramaic. Uh, so he is using Aramaic not only to communicate in the language of the common uh, listeners, but also to show that he was a devout Jew and had respect for the Jewish laws and customs. Uh, Paul spoke also Greek to the Roman of, uh, officials and Aramaic, Aramaic to the Jews. Now, uh, so he, he was a polyglot, so he could speak more than one language. He also spoke Hebrew, which is the religious language of Israel. Um, in Acts 22, 1 through 21, we see Paul's testimony. Uh, we read, Brothers and fathers, listen to my def defense. Verse 2, When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, verse 3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, in other words, in Jerusalem, under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just a zealous as zealous for God as any of you are today. Verse 4, I persecuted the followers of this way. Remember, the way is the nickname for the new religion, Christianity, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. Verse 5, as also the high priest and all the council can testify, I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners 
to Jerusalem to be punished. Verse 6, about noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. Verse 7, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, verse, uh, uh, still verse 7, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse 8, who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you are persecuting. He replied, and then he replied, verse 9, My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Verse 10, What shall I do, Lord? I asked. And the Lord said, Get up and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you need to have, uh, to have uh, so that you can be assigned to. Verse 11, my companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Verse 12, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. Verse 13, he stood beside me and said, Brother Saul received your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Verse 14, then he said, Then uh, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know this will and to see the righteous and one and, the, and to hear the words from his mouth. Verse 15, you will be his witness, witness to all men and uh, of what you have seen and heard. Verse 16, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Verse 17, when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance, verse 18, and say to the Lord, uh, uh, say the Lord speaking, quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Verse 19, Lord, I reply, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. Verse 20, and when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding their clothes as those who were killing him. Verse 21. Then the Lord said to me, Go, and I will send you far away, and this is the magic word, to the Gentiles. Now, Gamaliel was the most honored rabbi in Israel during the first century. He was well known and respected as an expert on religious law and as a voice of moderation, according to Acts 5.34. Paul was showing his credentials as he's describing who he, uh, you know, who his teacher was, as a well-educated man trained under the most respected Jewish rabbi. By saying that he was as zealous for God as, as the listeners, Paul was acknowledging their sincere motives, basically behind their desire to kill him. Paul always tried to establish a common point of contact. Uh, with his audience before launching into a, a full-scale defense of Christianity. When you witness for Christ, make sure that you first identify yourself with your audience. Uh, they will be much more likely to listen to you if you tell, uh, if they feel, you know, uh, a, a common ground, a common bond between you and, and them. Then Paul confessed to them his previous evil actions as a context for his conver conversion experience on his way to Damascus. So make sure that when you witness, make sure that you have a common point of contact, a friendship, uh, or, or something that would connect you uh, or have in common. Now, after gaining an, a hearing and establishing a common ground with his influence, Paul gave his testimony. He shared how he had come to faith in Christ. Sound, uh, sound reasoning is good, and he was smart to reason with them, but it is also important to simply share what Christ has done in our lives. And let me tell you, Paul could have sat down with these people and taught them all, all the Greek philosophy if he wanted to, but he didn't care to do that. He basically or simply shared his testimony. No matter how we present the message, not everyone will accept it. Uh, we must faithfully and responsibly present the gospel and leave the results to God, the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, Paul explained every little detail about his conversion experience, trying to reach their hearts. With his testimony, uh, though, he was exposing the truth that even though they may have some kind of religious training, and they had a lot, they, the Jews had, just like Paul did from the best, Gamaliel, but his, this training cannot take 
the place of a personal experience with Christ. You see, they, they thought that because they went to the rabbinical schools that they were uh, already, you know, saved, and because of that, they were uh, smarter and more intelligent than anyone else. Uh, but in reality, Paul is saying, I did all of that, and that's nothing. You don't accomplish any salvation through that. Only when you meet Jesus face to face. So Paul's testimony exposed his, uh, you know, his mistakes, right? I mean, his taken beliefs and actions. But and he also, uh, his testimony put him in a vulnerable state uh, because, right, he, uh, you know, he was exposing himself, but yet he was saying the truth. And Paul's conversion experience was an amazing one, as we find in, in Acts chapter 9. Now, Paul's testimony also emphasized how important it is to go beyond what's presented to us. Paul had the best theological exposure available during his days, and yet he was lacking until he met Jesus. And he was honest about that. He didn't have, uh, you know, salvation, although he knew all, a lot of stuff. We, uh, we all, every single human being, over the face of this earth, needs to have a personal encounter with Jesus. As Paul addressed the Jew, these Jews, uh, people listened in t- intently to him, but the word Gentile <laughs> brought out all their anger and exposed their pride who was behind them. Now, they were supposed to be a light to the world, to the Gentiles, right? Uh, telling them the truth about God. But they had renounced that mission by becoming separatist and exclusive people. God's plan, however, would not be thwarted. The Gentiles were hearing the good news through G- uh, Ju- uh, Jewish Christians such as Paul and Peter, and they were being converted for God. So the personal, a, a personal encounter with Jesus is a must. It's essential. Uh, it's, it's relevant, and we have to uh, make sure that we strive for that to get a personal encounter with Jesus. I invite you tonight to rec- reconsider your journey till today. And if you are like me, then you will see that you really have a need in your heart, in your mind. Like every single human being, then you and I are wretched, wretched miserable, unhappy, broken, run down, you know, mi- miserable. And, and, you know, so then you and I, we, need to surrender all to Jesus. All our frustrations, disappointments, pain, hate, misery, our mistakes, our sins, our pride, all of that stuff, just surrender it to Jesus. And Jesus will be allowed to work in our hearts and change our lives. I pray tonight, as we have studied what Paul's testimony did on behalf of the gospel, I pray that you and I also have a testimony to tell, that we'll be able to tell people what Jesus has done in our lives because you and I have been able to have a personal encounter with him. I encourage you, search for him personally, individually. Look for him through prayer, through Bible study, and make sure that you have that connection. And I pray as we are in the last Wednesday of the year, of year 2020, that as we start a new year, that each and every one of us will be able to resonate with the gospel and be, uh, make sure that we are on board by having a connection, a daily connection with Jesus our Lord. May the Lord bless you tonight, and thank you for tuning in. God bless you, and I'll see you next week. God bless you, God.